Well, thank you so much. It's so wonderful to be here with you. Thank you so much for giving this opportunity to me to speak about his amazing grace. He changed my life in an amazing way. I was a radical Muslim political leader, teacher, and uh, um, very much involved in politics there because Islam is a, relig a political religion. But then I'm here speaking for the Lord. It's just amazing. I praise his name. He not only changed my life, but he has been using me, my team, in a mighty way. We are reaching to millions of Muslims in the world. My ministry is called Exodus from Darkness. You either write this um, or just click my name, Daniel Shrestha, you'll find hundreds of videos, and, and also you'll find one of my books translated in 13 languages, freely accessible for more than a billion Muslims. And we are really touching the hearts of many people. God did in a, you know, amazing things in my life, revealed many things to me. I, I hope I'll be able to reveal some of them here tonight to encourage you. Anyhow, I have got a table there with my three books there. This is my life story, The House I Left Behind. It's an educational testimony. It teaches you how God changes a Muslim teacher, a, a leader, and a whole lot of logical reasoning there. And the second book, Islam and the Son of God, compares Islam with Christianity in every level if you want to have knowledge about Islam. And the third one, Christ above all, compares nine beliefs and religions together in a doctrinal, philosophical way, simple philosophy, because my English is simple, I cannot speak, <laughs> you know, uh, difficult English. And so um, they, they give you information, they prepare you how to talk to other people. And, um, and also I've got a list there, if you're a praying person, really, we need prayer desperately. You can get our prayer points and pray for us. Every two months we send um, there. The books are just based on suggestion. Please, if you are not unable to afford, be my guest. I'm, I will be delighted if you take the book. There you're not able to offer anything, that's fine. Just read there and see how Jesus is mighty and how beautiful, how beautiful you know, the values of Christ are. I'm going to give you a very brief on my testimony tonight, and I'm going to show you some pictures. Hopefully, I can't see there, but I can see here. Next one, please. I have come from the country Iran. I can't see there now. <laughs> um, I have come from the northern part of Iran by the Caspian Sea, very beautiful area, like, like Pennsylvania, a snowy, very strong snow there. And uh, born in a Muslim family, my father had two wives and uh, 12 children. We were all living together in one house. And from childhood, I was encouraged to get involved in uh, learning Islamic rituals and memorizing the Quran, recitation of the Quran. That's the important part of Muslim life. So I became a famous boy at the age of nine, and after that, people called me to their religious ceremonies. I performed Islamic rituals and recited the Quran, very popular among Muslims. Um, we learned from childhood that Islam is the last and perfect religion, should triumph the world. Everybody in the world must follow Islam. Muslims need to call them nicely first to join Islam. If they do not, then they start to become aggressive and that by threatening, asking neighbors and others to become Muslim if they reject that. And then the final step is the invasion, to invade them and force them to become Muslim. And the logic behind that was Islam is perfect. Everybody should follow, you know, that perfect religion. We never thought that if Islam is perfect, it should draw people's attention you know, logically, not by force, but anyhow. So, um, after uh, I entered university, I became a radical Muslim. Next one, please. Um, became the follower of uh, this gentleman, Ayatollah Khomeini. 
He didn't like the king of Iran because the king of Iran accepted Israel as a country. Muslims should not do that. If they do, they have to be killed. And also, we, especially students, I was a university student at that time, we didn't like the king because of political and social injustice. Iran was sitting and is still is sitting on oil base. It's a wealthy country, but people poor. And I was a poor student. I was really a good student, and, uh, but was unable to continue my study. And I thank God that some of my classmates helped me, and I was eventually able to complete my education. So all our positions came together and fought against the king, protest and creating some other things. You know, the king didn't feel secure in the country. He ran away and the country fell into our hand and uh, we captured the country next one, please. And uh, because I was one of the famous boys, that's me in front of other boys, uh, initially with one of them, and the third one, we were invited to be the chief commanders of uh, the Revolutionary Army. Now, that was a new army was going to be established. Iran had an army, a general army, but radical Muslims never trust the general army because many members of the general army are patriots, but you need soldiers, religious soldiers, who even can kill their parents or their family members because Islam should dominate. And so um, um, I was initially called for that, but it didn't work. I became an opposition very soon. Uh, next one, please. Um, I went my, to my hometown, and in my hometown, I became very active in a revolutionary way and worked a lot for my people, tribal people. I became very famous there. That's me there. I'm praying Islamic prayer. Next one. And uh, it started to prepare young boys and girls um, with fighting and uh, terrorist tactics and techniques because our goal was to go and capture Israel and uh, make Israel the capital of Islamic world. That's what committed Muslim, radical Muslim thing. And so for that, we needed to prepare our young boys, even though I was in opposition to Ayatollah, but all committed Muslim, doesn't matter their opposition, their target is Israel, and then, of course, the um, interest of uh, Christians in all over the world, especially those Christians who stand behind Israel. Next one, please. Um, this one is my wife. She uh, became also very much interested in preparing herself she was the most aggressive girl among all other girls, and uh, that drew my attention. I said, wow, this is mine. <laughs> so, and it's true, radical Muslim leaders really love aggressive girls and boys because they are the one they can complete the job. And so for the same interest, we got married. Next one, please. Um, this is our wedding day. You see how excited we are? Iranian peoples are exciting people, honestly, I'm saying culturally speaking. Iranian peoples have always competed with, you know, Greek culture. They are just noisy like Greek people. The only difference they have with Greek people, Greek um, people, you know, break their plates, but Iranians love their plates. <laughs> and so we got married, next one. Um, after our marriage, next one, our first child here, that's our daughter. She's not covered like my wife because she's not seven yet. She's around five. She was a big girl, actually. We had problems. Sometimes Claire just saw her with us in the road. They thought maybe she's seven. She had to be covered. And age of seven is the age of marriage in Islam. If you're seven years, you're, you're ready for marriage. For a man 20, even 80 years old, so you need to cover yourself. And that's why she's not covered. Next one, please. Um, that's a picture of my family. The third one is not yet there. Next one. This is my photo. I'm going to stay here a little bit. And this time I was a full opposition to the grand leader. 
And uh, I announced my candidacy for Islamic Parliament. He invited me, his party invited me to be his candidate. I rejected that because really the way he was leading the country, it was going to destroy the country and possibly you're listening to the news now, what's happening inside the country. He destroyed the economy of the country. He was sending all money to the Palestinians in that time and to Syria and also the newly established Hezbollah in, in, uh, um, in Lebanon, trying to capture Israel as soon as possible. He forgot his own people, and people were suffering economically because the relationship with other countries were just disconnected. Iran became the dire enemy to Western countries and especially to America. And so we told him, spend a little bit of money for our country. I mean, don't send all of them there, but he just was really mad, and because of that we became opposition. We won the government, actually. Independence won the government. One of my colleagues became the president of the country with 88% of people's vote. Uh, but he lost with 2% in less than a year. And Iranian realized that how dangerous he was and he, how he manipulated, it deceived Iranian people. However, it was too late. In that time, he, became, he himself became the chief commander of the Revolutionary Army and also forced you know, the parliament, and he had a lot of followers in parliament too, to pass a resolution to give him absolute authority. And it was passed, and it's a law in Islam. It's called Wilayat al faqih an Arabic word that means the sovereignty of the leader. So you even cannot question him, just like the Quran, you cannot question the Prophet of Islam. If you do, you have to be killed, according to the Quran. And, but that was disaster. He had already promised the Iranian people that if he would, you know, you know, took, he would give freedom to people. Now, we had a little bit freedom from the time of show. That has gone too. So that caused us to be opposition to him. And, win, but he was upset, he lost, and then he used power, and that's Islam. It says the election in Islam really doesn't make sense, just he was hoping to win through election and convince the world that he is the most wanted man in Iran, but after he lost, he just wanted to grab it by power, and uh, one, you know, three times uh, plotted to kill the president, and eventually he didn't feel it secure and he ran away from the country, the president, elected president of the country. And so the government was demolished. Some of us were able to run away and some were killed. I was one of them caught and uh, put in a cell. I lived, they put me in a toilet actually for three months. And after that I got the death sentence, they moved me to another state with four others. We were wa waiting in a room um, in death row. For all of all, for all four were killed, but I was able to run away by the help of some. I didn't know really they were putting their life in risk for me. I thought possibly I was released because I was a very famous leader in the area in my hometown. And I thought maybe they released me because I'm famous, just kill me outside and then come and mourn over my dead body. You know, I was thinking, but then I realized uh, some of my friends, they put their life in risk and they played some legal games and freed me so I could run away from Iran to Turkey. Um, in first initiative, I was caught actually in the border and a religious guard truck hit me and uh, threw me to a valley. They thought I was dead, but I didn't die. Um, people find me and then called my family and friends. They look after me. It took for me one and a half year just to stand like this. But after that, I was able to find another secure way and to cross the border of Iran and Turkey. I entered Turkey. Immediately, I went to the United Nations and uh, um, introduced myself. I said, my family there, they can, you know, create any time problem for my wife and children. So in Turkey, I was alone, and uh, Turkish is my mother language, a little bit different to the Turkish in Turkey. I had several months, I spent time over it, learned it. And then I decided to enter university, uh, Istanbul University, and to you know, complete my doctorate there. Uh, with my supervising professor, we chose a subject for my doctorate major, 
That was how religions, cultures, and philosophies affect people's life and attitude. And uh, it, they do, you know, your belief affects your life, you know. Your, your life is different to the life of people who do not follow Christ, and I hope so. <laughs> I pray that, uh, you know, we manifest that really, and it becomes visible to people. And it, obviously, it's visible in, in all over the world. If you go to India, if you go to China, if you go to Iran, in America, you see life different because of their cultures and beliefs. So that's what I was going to do, to bring the major religions of the world, top religions, and also philosophies like, you know, uh, communism, even though communism has become a religion, uh, socialism, humanism, all of them, you know, to compare them with each other and see in what way, you know, they affect people's lives. What are their approaches to freedom? What kind of leadership they have? what kind of family they have, what are their organizational culture, what, what is the leadership in them. They are so important in every way. You see, Jesus has saved us spiritually, but we need to know how He has shaped us socially too, in what way we can be effective on people socially. That's what I'm doing really. I'm not only speaking to Muslim world in a spiritual way, I'm also showing to them, unless you follow the leadership of Jesus Christ, you won't be able to have a successful business. So, this, this was what I was going to do in the university. But before my investigation, really, I was thinking that Islam would come first again, you know. I didn't have knowledge about Islamic social and political philosophy. I even didn't know that as a Muslim, my religion didn't have work ethic. And I, I learned that in the universe that, that no other religion but Christianity has work ethic. Well, socialism, communism, they cannot have work, they cannot have work ethic. Everything is random, you know, accident. Accident it doesn't walk hand in hand, you know, uh, with, with ethic. So, I started the investigation and completed my investigation. I was shocked and amazed. Shocked because of my Islamic belief. I was always taught, thinking that Islam is the best and perfect religion in every way. Now, I found the Islam lower than every other religion. Even paganism is better than Islam. Now, why? You see, I love this word, why, where, how. These are only usable in Jesus Christ. No other religion. Now, even in New Age, you cannot use it because new age is called your God. You're aloof from other people. You know, you don't need other people to use the word why or where others. You know, I don't want to go into that philosophy. I have a message here tonight for you. I just want to tell you they don't have it. You know, it, in, but I found that even paganism is better than Islam. Because in paganism, at least they, socially speaking, not spiritually, spiritually they are in darkness. Socially, they are calling you God. I think this is a little bit better than when Islam calls you animal. And Islam even calls Muslim animal when it comes to decision making. Al-Avam kal an'am, it's an Arabic phrase that means all people are animals. Allah has already decided for you. The Prophet of Islam decided. You don't need decision. You just need to surrender and follow. Low than other religions, socially speaking. But I was amazed to find Christianity at the top in every way. In every way. And especially about individual freedom. And actually I discovered that individual freedom only makes sense in Christianity, not in any other religion. It's a very broad topic. It's a very delicious topic, 
You need to know that, but maybe, maybe another time I need to come to your church, have a conference here. With, you know, it, it will be my honor. I just live by faith. I'm, I, I, I just walk for Christ. You know, I love him. I, I really want... I really want Christians to understand. You know, I'm, I have come from a dark background, and I have seen the light. I'm not saying that you haven't seen the light, but it's good to see light in every part of our life. That makes you amazed. I was amazed, really, to see that Christianity was the most powerful belief in every way and make sense in every way, especially the leadership of Christianity, you know, individual freedom, family organization, you know, organizational culture. Oh, I don't know where to start really. Let me give you an example about organization. You're the organization of Jesus Christ. Church is the organization of Jesus Christ. The world's most successful businesses are following your culture, but some of them are fighting with the church because they cannot make any money without the culture of the church. You're the organization of the church, uh, Christ. In that organization, his gospel says the members love one another like the members of one body. You see my body? Members love one another. I'm 68 now. In this past 68, for a single moment, I never saw my hand say to my leg, I hate you. They love each other so much. You see, that's the logic of Jesus Christ. And I was a professor in a university for eight years. I taught there. It's taught in the universities. The best organization is that organization that the members are in harmony with each other, and they have a leader. He is a participative leader, humble leader, and... Uh, it's just one with the members. It's just like a member. Members easily come to talk to them freely. And uh, because that freedom creates creativity. That culture is taught in the university. It mat matches only the le leadership culture of this book. No other religion and cultural philosophy has such an organizational culture. That was the reason Western countries survived against communism. Because in Western countries, people started to understand if we are Christians, we need to love other people. Our business should create success for other people too. And that's called Christian ethic. And that means an ethic that always is win-win, not win-lose. Christ doesn't have win-lose. Christ came for everybody to win. That's the Christian ethic. It's the yummy and delicious ethic. It's a powerful, creative ethic. That leadership is creative because dictatorship doesn't allow you to talk. I have come from a dictator country. I just criticized them in a nice way. The leader, I got a death sentence. But in Christianity, you can't criticize even God. You can even kick him out from your life. You're free. Because he has created you with freedom, he respects your freedom. That's why he says, come and reason together. That's Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18. You know, blown away. I'm not, I'm not going to go in it. It just takes a lot, really. And I'm, but very powerful. I really encourage you to start, make, you know, understand everything in Christ. Because... That's the only weapon we have. 
We don't have any other weapon that socialists have, radical Muslims have. Ours is just to touch minds, hearts, and help them to allow their consciences to listen. For this, we need to really understand Christ in every way. So I was really blown away after my investigation in the university. That changed my worldviews towards Christianity, but not still a follower of Christ. Very disappointed with Islamic political and social philosophy. But I praise his name that he had a plan for me. He was just, you know, orchestrating everything, you know, just leading my life, even though they were painful, for, in some parts were painful for me. But, you know, I think it was because of my stiff neckness. Um, through a business deal, I lost $30,000 to my business partner. He took my money and he's run away. Uh, in Turkey, he was a Muslim, Iranian Muslim in Turkey. And so I couldn't chase him legally. I was trying to find a friendly way to approach him, to find him and beg him to give my money back. I had family, so just to encourage him in that way. But I didn't know any friend of his in Turkey. Somebody said to me that there is a bunch of Christians coming to him sometimes. Iranian Christians who ran away from Iran went to Turkey and uh, they had a fellowship there. A couple of Americans and other Europeans also were there, you know, trying to work among Iranians. So I decided to go to their church. First, for, for the first time in my life, I'm going to a church for my money, not for Christ. I entered the church. I was shocked. They were playing music here. Music is illegal in Islam. Radical Muslims take over. They destroy every instrument. That's what Ayatollah did at the beginning of his uh, rule in Iran and Afghanistan, you know, Taliban. Um, surprisingly, I saw a couple of ladies also standing in front of people and singing. You don't see ladies in a mosque. There is a cover there. You can see them. They do not raise their voices. It was surprising to me, you know. Anyway, um, it was frightening, too, politically. Oh, I'm in a bad place. That can cause problem for my family in Iran if a Muslim sees me that I'm here. But anyway, my money was big. I had to do something. And uh, so I stayed there, and after the fellowship, I shared my story with them, and they became so sad. They offered their help to me. They said, we can find him for you in Germany. We have many friends there. We would write to them. Just keep in touch with us, they encouraged me. I said, um, how can I keep in touch with you? I was really afraid to go to church. I was expecting they would come and see me. Um, I said, how can I keep in touch with you? And they told me, come to the church. Well, unlike my desire, I said, okay. Um, but I, I was afraid to go to church because a Muslim should not go to a church, especially a fugitive Muslim like me. I have already run away from a death sentence. Do not want to have the second one here. But I went home. I said, if I don't go there, they think possibly I have lied to them. I need to be serious. I need to show seriousness. So then Sunday after Sunday, I went to the church for my money. Um, I found them very nice people, very honest people. I was really amazed. I was not expecting that much. You, saw, you see, my brothers and sisters, you're very nice, but people outside do not know. Many of them do not know. Even in America, who were born in America, who are white American, who are black American, their parents lived here. Some of them think that Christians are bad people. Church and Christianity takes people, you know, back, holds them behind. They don't know that, so we, you need to really manifest that. We need to manifest that. And I saw that example in them. It's just amazing. We need examples. We need to see examples. I was thinking that my God was the best. My religion was the best without seeing any example from others. <clears throat> I was amazed, really. 
seeing such examples for them. What happened after that, their niceness caused me to listen to their messages. I was not listening because Quran says, do not listen to Christians. You're putting your life in danger. I listened, I was amazed. Their teaching about God was amazing. I was teaching philosophy in Iran. I never knew that the philosophy of God in this book is different to the philosophy of God in all other religions. And I, this church, this little church was really prepared. They were teaching that God in the Bible is the personal God. I never knew that. The general philosophy in the world teaches God is impersonal. In other words, does, God doesn't have any personality in order to have personal relationship with people. That's why there is no salvation in any other religion. They leave everything for the life after. Why? Because God is not personal to have personal relationship with them to save them here. But they do not know that philosophy is wrong. If God is personal, he is eternally impersonal. Then he won't be able to save you there too. <laughs> you know? But their messages made sense to me. God must be personal. Why? Because only personal being can have image. Image is the personal being. You can attribute to only personal being. Impersonality means non-personality. You cannot say non-person has brain. That doesn't make sense. Non-person has image. So it made sense to me, wow, this is amazing, that's right. So that's why everything is carrying the image of someone, inventor, creator. You see, I have gone for my money, what's happening here? It's drawing my attention. Then after a while I had a dream. The following Sunday I went to the church, I heard my dream from the pulpit. I was amazed. At that dream, their teachings, my university study all encouraged me to read their book personally. I grabbed the New Testament, started to read it. New Testament is an amazing book. It's an amazing God philosophy book. Especially John chapter 1 is the most powerful philosophical chapter. Those verses you heard, he is worth, he was worth. The word is the definition of God in philosophy. What is God? The philosopher responds to you, the word. No matter which back background or religious background, Hindu, Christian, Islam, it's Greek philosophy, all of them. God is the word. But what kind of word? The definition for word shows the difference of the definition of Bible with other definitions. In all other religions, the word is impersonal, I already told you. It's non-relational because it doesn't have any personality, so you cannot have a relationship with that word. Because there is no relational relationship, therefore, the word is unknown, so gods in all other religions are unknown, and people are following unknown God. You remember Paul in chapter 17 of Act? He was walking in the streets of Athens, unknown God. That's the Greek philosophy other religions have borrowed. They are following unknown God. They don't know God. I have, a, I have a lot of things in my heart. I'm just trying to go, you know, finish on time. But the word has a different definition here. The word became flesh. Why? First of all, because the word is personal. A personal being can reveal himself or itself in any way. Second, the personal God wants to make himself known. 
because he's interested in loving relationship. If you want to fall in love with someone, you need to know that person. Am I correct? That's the nature of love. You need to know. When you fall in love, oh, I know. I know this girl, I know this boy. Oh, wow, we are matching. That knowledge is necessary, absolutely necessary there. So God reveals himself to you to make himself known to you, to draw your attention. That's in verse 14, to draw your attention, to manifest his full glory, truth, justice to you. You're marveled. Oh, wow, that's so beautiful. I want him. And then you open the door of your heart. He comes in. The other guy runs out. Because they cannot be roommate together. One comes, the other one goes. And then you say, the mighty God of the universe is sitting on the throne of my heart. Emmanuel, God is with me. And that's why Paul says, if God is with us, who is against us? See, logically, it's true too. It's, it was amazing to me, really. With thirst, I finished the gospel for the first time. And then imagine, after John, you go and read Paul's writing. Paul is an amazing man. I finished the gospel, I, I found that the God of Islam and other gods are just made in the image of men. They are not true gods. They were interested in God, but they didn't give themselves hard time to investigate who God can be. They just introduced God. They cannot, you know, be proven practically. I started to read the gospel for the second time, the second time was the love of Jesus Christ really touched my entire, you know, soul, my body, convinced me. Christ has the only right definition for love. He says love must be unconditional. Actually, the definition for the love must be unconditional, logically too. Not only God says, well, I'm absolutely the source of love, and I offer unconditional love. But logically, it is proven too. We have reason for that. Love should be 100% unconditional, 100%, not, not 85%. Do you go to your beloved one and say, darling, I love you 85%? <laughs> you don't. Even you cannot say to your darling, I'm going to love you with the depths of my heart. I'm going to raise that 85% to 99.99%. Because that 0.1% is ugly. Your honey can ask you, now where are you going to spend that you know, 0.1%? You see, this book is amazing. This book really is amazing. This book should be the crown of your head. You need to live for this book. You need to live for Christ. You need to learn this thing. I'm, I'm humbly, I'm talking to you here. I'm not interested in going only to churches to speak. I know this is the only solution for us. This is the only solution for America. Whatever evil in this country is happening, it is affecting all the world. You need to wake up. My brothers and sisters, please, invest for your children, for your grandchildren. This is the only solution. I'm not joking with you. You're going to suffer. The only solution is Jesus Christ. Anyhow, next, next one. I gave my heart to Jesus. Next, next, I'm smiling here, you see. <clears throat> next one brought my family and she joined me. She didn't know I was a follower of Christ. I couldn't tell her. You remember she had a gun? <laughs> um, 
I couldn't tell her because she was a, she knew Islam. In Islam, if you're a spouse or anybody, a family member changes religion, you need to divorce, you need to excommunicate them, you need to cooperate with the leaders to kill him or her. So I didn't want to push her to that chaos. I wanted her to come and see the changes in my life. The changes are amazing, especially when husband changes. She was aggressive. She was unable to say to me, no. No matter how aggressive your wives are, Koran says you can beat them, you can lock them in the room until they die. Chapter 4, read Koran, chapter 4. That changes. She came and saw the changes in my life. She was amazed. She saw the changes more amazing. You know, I was smiling. I was, I forgot she was there sometimes. I was singing with joy. Singing, music is illegal. This, is, this guy was a radical Muslim. How can it be? He's singing. She thought, she worried that I had gone crazy. So in the second week, she asked me, what has happened to you? That scared me. For the first time, I was scared from my wife. Because if she understand, now she is going to be my boss. I have lost authority. And then she would have authority to take the children and go back. That's minimum. She could go back, go to call Muslims to come and cut me in pieces. Who cares that Christian is dead in an Islamic country? So that scared me. She would take the children and go back. But I praise his name. I praise him. I love him so much. I really love him so much. I, have, I know a lot of things, but I have seen him practically in my life. Amazing. He's amazing. He has proven that to me. He had a plan for her, too. It's a long story. She remained there. She didn't go back, but she gave her time to me. She's the boss now. And sometimes I wanted to prove to her what kind of husband I was. And Jesus always said, shh. I didn't know that quietness was crushing the tower of Islam in her heart. How can this man be patient? And in my absence, without asking me, she was searching my gospel to find where the gospel changes people. She didn't tell me for some reason, Islamic reason, but I caught her one night with my book. Amazing. That opened the door for me after that to talk to her, encourage her to attend Christian ladies' meeting. She always said no. Eventually, I was persistent, begging her. She went, came back. She was blown away. The ladies were talking there free. One said, Oh, the Lord spoke to my heart this morning. The other one said, the Lord spoke to me last night. She said, who is this Lord who is just speaking to ladies? In Islam, the Lord didn't speak even to the, to the prophet of Islam. He never heard the voice of God. He just said the angel came to me and brought the message for me. And he even didn't see the angel. But she said, I am following a perfect religion. I am in a perfect prison. I cannot talk. But these people, we call them infidels. They are free. They came back. She came, I asked her, how did you find the meeting? She said, oh, wow. These ladies are free. Are you going to continue? She said, yeah, I think so. Then after a while, she had a dream. Her dream was written in the Bible. I read the dream to her. She just started to cry. I softened her heart toward Jesus and then read the gospel seriously. And after two and a half months, she gave her heart to the Lord. Next one, please. My brothers and sisters, I have lost a lot for the Lord Jesus. I don't have time to talk to you. I have already taken extra time. Forgive me for that. Could you please love him dearly? Please do that. Thank you so much.